Hey, good, good morning, everyone. I, we're just doing a quick mic check. I know it's about a minute before we're supposed to get started. Uh, go ahead and, if you can, I really appreciate it if you go on the chat and uh, say hi and maybe do a quick introduction of yourself. We want to make this interactive and make sure that uh, we, we were able to answer questions. This is the, you know, the real value of this online meetup is that you can interact with us and engage with us. So uh, definitely be active in the, in the discussion. Cool. Okay, well, I think we're going to get started. It's 10.01. We like to be diligent here and start on time for those who showed up on time. If you don't mind, let us know if the audio is, is clear or not. We'd really appreciate it. So I'm just super excited to have Dima here today. I mean, I've worked with him in the past. He was actually on our team, but he was kind of, I guess, too smart for our team. Yeah, so, come he, on. <laughs> so he left the team and wanted to do something a lot, a lot more interesting, I guess. So, you know, we have Dima here, and and I'm excited to have him talk about uh, intermediate Kubernetes. He's just got a tremendous amount of experience working with customers on Kubernetes. So, just a quick caveat, you know, I did uh, make sure that this is intermediate Kubernetes. So, if you have questions about what is a container, never heard of Kubernetes, this might go over your head. But uh, we're going to give a quick 10 minute overview. Of, of just what Kubernetes is. Uh, Dima, you want to introduce yourself? If you absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, Dima Nefetkin, Strategic Customer Engineer for Google Cloud Customers. Um, yeah, absolutely. I do work with uh, Kubernetes customers a lot. Some of them already using uh, Kubernetes. The others are in progress of evaluating that. So uh, what we're going to do today is, uh, first of all, we'll do a quick intro there might be a bit um, too much slides in <laughs> in my presentations, but I will try to minimize uh, our time that we'll spend on slides, and uh, we'll do some live demos instead. So um, yeah, that's me and Jonathan on on the slide. So uh, <laughs> pleasant looking guys. <laughs> uh, cool. So quick recap: what Kubernetes is about. So. When you are having your containers, uh, when you containerize your application, uh, the question that you now have is how to run these uh, containers and how to schedule them, how to manage life cycle. Uh, what about scale? How to discover uh, you know, one uh, service presented by one container and make it available for the other? How to load balance stuff? How to connect your storage volumes? All that type of questions. Um, going to be uh, solved by uh, something which is called a uh, container uh, scheduling system. And uh, one of them is Kubernetes. So why Kubernetes um, is relevant and uh, when it actually became available? It's already two, I think, uh, more than two years, right? It has been announced in June 2014 and GA since uh, June 2015, so it's like year and a half in general availability, and uh, there was a lot of releases. It's already 1.5 that have been released um, December last year. Yeah. So uh, it was indeed an initiative started by Google employees, um, especially the guys 
with a very deep knowledge uh, that spend a lot of time working on internal uh, scaling systems at Google, uh, such as Borg and Omega. Um, but as you can see in these slides, um, that's not just you know Google folks that are contributing to the project. That is currently a thing that is uh, under so-called cloud native computing foundation. And you see that a lot of uh, companies um, such as Red Hat and CoreOS and Mirantis and uh, independent contributors are making this um, project better and better and adding more and more features. So Kubernetes can be considered as a stable uh, cluster scaler currently. Uh, it's definitely um, having an API uh, which is uh, stable enough. Features that are added uh, in Kubernetes are added into three tracks, uh, alpha, beta, and GA. Um, most probably uh, the newest features are available in alpha and uh, next release or maybe in two release, uh, they are promoted to beta and then go into GA. Um, some of the features are pluggable, such as the volume and network plugins. So uh, that is definitely a pretty uh, scalable and stable framework. So just in case it wasn't clear, you know, Kubernetes was built it is kind of an extension of what we've built internally. It's open source, and today Deem is really focusing on the open source version. Google Cloud Platform has their own hosted version. Exactly. Actually, the demo demos that I'm going to do tomorrow, one of them will be on like on the laptop, showing mm -hmm. that Kubernetes can be uh, absolutely uh, running well even on your Mac or mm -hmm. Windows laptop if 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 you like. Um, but yeah, you're right that there are scheduled, uh, I mean, uh, not scheduled, but the uh, hosted versions of Kubernetes and Google Container Engine is one of the like the easiest way to have your Kubernetes cluster available. So to uh, really appreciate the hosted version, you have to go ahead and install and create your own cluster. Uh, yeah, you know, things are getting better. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely uh, um, not for faint-hearted uh, yeah. <laughs> to install it's... Kubernetes from scratch yeah. maybe a year ago. Mm -hmm. Now things are uh, way, way better, but you absolutely right. GKE is still like a point-and-click solution to have a cluster available. Right. And you see that ecosystem around Kubernetes is growing and uh, we do support uh, that on different cloud providers, uh, different distributions like CoreOS, Tectonic, and Mirantis Murano uh, having uh, Kubernetes uh, as the foundation. And the platform as a service solutions like Red Hat OpenShift uh, in uh, version three, Red Hat has based OpenShift on, um, on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, showing how ecosystem is growing and how the other um, market um, um, members are looking at this um, containerized uh, framework and um, just moving forward with that. So, and some numbers on the number of commits and contributors. Of course, these numbers are not accurate. Uh, things are growing on the daily basis. You just see some logos of customers that are already using Kubernetes into production, and that might be either GKE or Kubernetes on AWS or on premises, bare metal Kubernetes. There's so many ways, and that's the beauty of of uh, of that product that you are really uh, not uh, restricted to a single platform. All right, so let's quickly recap what are the main concepts, because uh, it will be really um, important for us to understand what Kubernetes is all about. So um, in Kubernetes world, you have a master and uh, you have nodes. Master is the uh, component uh, where your API server is actually running. So all the uh, requests that users are sending to Kubernetes via API calls, command line interface, or UI actually uh, go to API server. And the API server actually interacts with nodes. And the nodes are running uh, so-called kubelet. Uh, kubelet is a component that is actually interacting with nodes. And uh, so the central state of the cluster is um, stored on master. That's what we uh, use etcd for. It's a distributed uh, storage. And Kubelet is uh, constantly pulling uh, etcd for changes. And if there's a new uh, component, like a pod has been, um, has been um, created, uh, we need to schedule it somewhere. And uh, that's where uh, you know, Kubelet actually uh, coming into play. Uh, of course, the scheduling decisions are done, again, by the specific component that's a scheduler. Currently, we have a single scheduler on, on, in Kubernetes, but uh, I know that some works in uh, progress to have multiple schedulers supported. Mm -hmm. 
And Just a quick recap yeah. of what pods are. I mean, pods yeah, are. absolutely. Yeah, so that's exactly my next slide. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, pods. So as you understand, um, you've Dockerized your application. You have a Docker container. And uh, what you can do, you can just run container by itself. Uh, but it would be great to have some abstraction on top of that uh, that will allow you to have a stable um, IP address for, for that pod uh, that might allow you to have several things connected together and looking like a single entity. And that's what pod is all about. So in most of the scenarios that we see so far, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between pod and container, but it's not absolutely uh, you know, a mandatory thing. Uh, we have scenarios like, for example, on this slide, that uh, there's a um, web server and a file pooler containers that are connected to the same volume, and they expose to the, you know, to the, to the other components, to the other services, like a single pod. Uh, so that's like a shared fate, uh, uh, same life cycle. Uh, both containers, uh, in this case, will be uh, scheduled uh, at the same node at the same time. So, um, so Dima, with your experience, yep. you've seen customers use pods. How are they kind of, are they typically one-to-one -one with pods or just varies? You know, um, it's 90% of the things I'm seeing right now, it's one-to-one. -one. Wow. Okay. Uh, but it's absolutely not the case for everything. There mm -hmm. is such a concept as sidecar containers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of um, scenarios where you can plug in additional container to your main one. For okay. example, to do SSL of loading uh, in Got some it. really interesting scenarios. Or um, uh, there are frameworks that are introspecting all the calls, and uh, you can do side such, such sort of sidecar containers there. Mm -hmm. Or I know HashiCorp Vault is pretty popular among Kubernetes customers to store secrets mm -hmm. instead of basic secret, secret object. Okay. And uh, you can uh, plug in HashiCorp Vault via this port. Got it. Um, okay. You're probably talking about yeah. secrets later, right? Yeah, I okay. will. I will do that as well. <laughs> so networking, as I already mentioned, um, each pod is having a stable. Um, uh, not stable, but the external like IP address that is accessible uh, by the other um, pods in, in the cluster. So uh, there's no brokering on port numbers. That is really important because, for example, in Borg, in, in internal Google uh, scheduler, uh, you have to deal with the port uh, uh, port scheduling. Um, and uh, to get rid of port conflicts, you have to figure out uh, how you, know, uh, you will deal with ports. And ports are becoming a uh, Another one, a resource that you have to to yeah. think about, and we are like eliminating this problem um, in in Kubernetes world. And there's different networking um, setups that you can have in Kubernetes. That might be L3 uh, routed um, networking. It might be overlays and underlays. There are companies like uh, Project Calico and Flannel and the others that are doing really sophisticated networking stack that is working with Kubernetes networking. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's just an example that you see here. Uh, we have three hosts um, in uh, ten dot one um, uh, dot uh, ten dot one dot one zero ten dot one dot two zero and ten dot one dot three zero, and we have containers. Uh, I mean pods scheduled uh, on that host, and all of uh, these pods can interact with each other. Uh, without any uh, additional uh, work uh, to be done on our side. That's like a baseline of Kubernetes networking. Hey, Dima, so there is a question about what L3 routed means in, in the Kubernetes networking. I assume that it just means that they don't need to be on the same subnet. They are just they can be on different subnets. Or what, what is L3 routed? Yeah, so let, let's just uh, recall what is L3. L3 right. is, is IP, uh, IP level mm -hmm. routing, right? So that means that we can do IP routing mm -hmm. uh, without any additional uh, work to be done on our side. Right. So sometimes I think when people set it up, let's say you don't have flannel or calico, mm -hmm. you basically add static routes, you know, right? On, uh, on the nodes. That's, I mean, if you don't have flannel and calico and they, you are on your cloud provider, you'd better to utilize the underlying um, networking fabric of the cloud provider in case of uh, mm -hmm. GC, that will be GC fabric. The same thing with AWS. When you are in your on-premise uh, data center right. networking world, you have to uh, to decide how to how to deal, and that's where you know Calico and Flannel mm -hmm. and all the solutions like that are really getting more and more popular. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so you can have a lot of uh, containers and the other resources that we're going to talk about, but you need to distinguish between them somehow, organize yeah. them, right? And that's why namespaces is a good way uh, to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. You can just you know, say, hey, here are the things that um, uh, needed to be in that namespace. And uh, when you do interact uh, with the services in the one namespace, by default, uh, there's some like isolation layer that allows you to, uh, to get rid of the others. So uh, now you have your pods, right? Uh, you need to uh, somehow to make sure you can um, access to them. And that's why labels and label queries uh, are really important. It's like selectors, right? So you can attach uh, one to, I don't know how many uh, labels per, per object, like a pod, like an application controller, and uh, then do um, selectors. Like in this slide, for example, we have an application uh, with the uh, front end pods and back end pods, and some of them are like in production, the others are um, in test. And you can just say, hey, uh, can you, can you um, retrieve all the uh, pods that are actually front end pods uh, related to my application, or back end pods, or maybe all the production pods? Uh, it's up to you how to define labeling. There's nothing like prescriptive around that. Um, so that means that you can, in theory, use one Kubernetes cluster for both uh, production and test. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, will you really do that? Depends on different requirements. Um, I see most of the customers are like distributing uh, production and test workloads across different clusters, mm -hmm. which I think makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, now in the world of, uh, web stateless applications, that's always multiple containers, right, of the same size. You need to, let's say, occupy um, a pretty uh, substantial uh, cluster with, with your workloads, and you need, let's say, 20 of uh, web containers or whatever type of, uh, whatever number of web containers. That's where replica sets uh, will help you. So uh, you will just say that uh, I need to run that kind of pod uh, that you can um, retrieve by that selector. Uh, it's based on this template, and I need uh, that number of replicas. So um, the API server will be um, watching how many uh, of the pods we have scheduled already. If it's um, it's like you know, it's like the um, process of control loop checking. If it's uh, not enough, we'll schedule new ones. If it's too much, we'll you know kill the existing ones. Is so, the API server typically on the master? It's not typical. It's all, it's on the it's, master. No, it it's is always on the, on the master. Yeah, okay. there's no possibility for you to have API server running on the on the node. No, it's okay. Because in this case, a node will become. <laughs> and a master, right. and uh, there's no such a construct like multi-master mm -hmm. architecture in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different from Docker Swarm, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, it, how, how do customers deal with high availability? Then, let's say your master goes down. Um, I mean, I think there was a thing called yeah. federated, but I don't know. If yeah, so federation is a bit out of scope of our discussion yep. today. Yeah. Um, but in general. Um, I know there's a lot of work in uh, in the area of high availability masters right, right now. Right. Um, if you run, uh, for example, your uh, your Kubernetes environment as the Google Container Engine, mm -hmm. uh, we do manage master for you. Okay. So this master is something that uh, Google manage. You okay. just so if it goes down, nodes. we spin one up immediately. Like exactly. And by the way. Uh, just you know to to be super clear yeah. even if master is down yeah. your workloads can work right. Right? right what master actually is is the way to you know to make sure that we have like a shared state we have the api endpoints mm -hmm. but your workloads that's already running uh, they do not depend on master so right. you can just you know be in the freezed state right mm -hmm. but that's that's how it is OK, so just to speed up a bit, um, services is the way how you can um, create an abstraction on top of pods uh, to give like a stable virtual IP and DNS name that will allow different services to communicate with each other. So services can be uh, load balanced. They can be headless. Headless means that there's no um, stable IP, and this D virtual DNS name will be resolved across multiple. Uh, multiple pods that um, do exist. So 
services can be external. Um, there's a type of service uh, called node port that allow you to schedule, uh, expose a port on every node, and uh, via this port, you can interact with the service. Or you can use a service type of load balancer, and in this case, if you're, let's say, in the Google Cloud environment, we will do provision um, network load balancing for you. And again, if you need something even uh, more uh, high level, uh, specifically uh, L7 load balancing with the HTTPS um, of loading availabilities, um, there's an ingress object. That's a separate object in Kubernetes uh, API that allow you to expose uh, your services uh, via, uh, via a load balancer supported either in the cloud platform or there are implementations for HAProxy and Nginx as well. So um, now you have your uh, services and uh, pods and replica sets running. You need to update uh, things, right? Uh, you want to do that in the way so your production traffic is not really affected. Uh, deployments is the way for you to um, execute uh, rollouts pretty smoothly. So you can just say, uh, I want to upgrade uh, this pod from that version to that version. And uh, using rolling upgrades, uh, deployment object can just gradually decrease the number of pods of, from the old version and increase the number of pods of the new version. That's uh, very, uh, very solid and uh, uh, heavily uh, used concept. Um, now, a quick one about daemon sets. Um, the replica sets that we uh, just uh, mentioned allow you to run multiple uh, containers at the same time, right? But you are really not influencing where these containers are running on which nodes. You're just saying, okay, I want five, and that's basically it. Uh, now, let's say that there are some workloads when you're interested in running a single container on the node. Uh, why that might be the case? Well, maybe that's some agent for monitoring software that need to be sitting on, on every node. Um, so in this case, daemon sets uh, might be uh, a solution. It might be on every node. That might be on the subset. Using the uh, label selector again, you can um, you can specify uh, which nodes should be covered. Uh, again, another one type of uh, controller that we have in Kubernetes is job. Uh, job is something that is executed uh, to completion. So pods are running like. I mean, not, not pods, but replica sets are running infinitely, right? If uh, one of the pods is down, the other will be scheduled. That's not the case with jobs. Uh, you just need to, uh, to finish the job until the end, and that's basically it. Uh, and we just added cron job support, by the way, as well. So now you can think about uh, your Kubernetes cluster as uh, the uh, cron scheduling environment as well. Cool. Uh, now let's move on to the more sophisticated concepts. Volumes. Uh, there's always uh, a lot of discussions about storage and containers, right? Because you need to make sure that your containers are working well in the environments where you need to connect volume and uh, uh, consume that, uh, that volume from the container. So how it's organized in Kubernetes? Uh, there's the object called persistent volume. Uh, we do support different types of volumes that might be uh, I don't know, ClusterFS volume. That might be uh, AWS uh, volume. It might be Google Cloud Storage Persistent Disk volume. Um, volume should be either provisioned by the administrator or auto-provisioned um, if um, such a uh, configuration have been uh, set it up. And then you can consume that volume. How are you consuming that? Uh, there's an object called Persistent Volume Claim. So you're claiming that, hey, I want to use that specific volume. So how that works? Plus administrator is provisioning persistent volumes for you. That's like the first step. Now, your user is interested in uh, consuming these volumes. So that's why uh, the user is uh, creating a persistent volume claim uh, object. And this persistent volume claim object is bounded to one of the, uh, one of the persistent volumes. No, it's, it's bounded to the, yeah, it's bounded to the persistent volume. And when pod is scheduled, it's actually referencing not the persistent volume itself, it's referencing the claim. So in this case, if pod, let's say, will go down and another one pod will be scheduled, it will be binded to the same persistent volume claim that will give you a chance to have one-to-one -one mapping between, you know, I mean, uh, you have a stability between your persistent volume claim and the persistent volume. 
And uh, when user is saying, no, I don't need this pod anymore, and they delete um, API call is scheduled, uh, the pod goes down, pod is deleted, persistent volume claim is deleted as well, and then there might be a recycling procedure that will delete persistent volume itself at the very end. Mm -hmm. So that's the sequence of steps uh, that we have uh, with volumes. And again, when we're talking about volumes, uh, it's a good idea to mention configuration maps. Uh, have you heard about 12-factor uh, apps and uh, this 12-factor manifesto? Yeah, I think we should assume audience knows 12-factor. I mean, it's just kind of the, the, the basis for microservices. And yeah, absolutely. And 12-factor says that configuration should come from the environment. Mm -hmm. And Kubernetes is your environment. So you need to make sure you can change your configuration without, let's say, redeploy redeploying uh, your, uh, your container. So that's the thing. You can define an object called config map, specify some configuration there. You will see that in my demo in a minute. And uh, later on, you can bind that config map to a container um, using um, a similar syntax like you're doing that with volumes and uh, just use that. And you can update it later on. It's like an environment variable. And it will be picked by the, your uh, Kubernetes environment. Mm -hmm. And the similar concept is secret. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest difference between config map and secrets is that, uh, well, secrets are having something associated with security, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's possible um, to, uh, to place some, something like, I don't know, um, passwords and uh, certificates uh, into the secrets object. Sure. Some customers are using secrets. Some customers are using HashiCorp Vault because they want like a centralized secret management environment. Um, that is also doable. Um, but, uh, you know, secrets is, again, uh, the way to go. Interesting thing that I wanted to quickly cover is the init containers because it will be in my demo. Uh, init containers is the way for you to initialize your your pods before they actually started. Why that might be relevant? Let's say that uh, your pod will be consuming some volumes, and these volumes, of course, will be mounted to this pod. But you need to initialize these volumes before. You need to copy some stuff from, let's say, config map from secret, maybe even from uh, some remote repository. Uh, that's what you can do with init containers. And they can be chained. You can have several init containers that are running uh, one after the other in the specific order. And uh, uh, that's the way how you can initialize uh, things. So it helps you order how things are kind of like in the old way where you had to boot up the database first, and then you boot up the web server. This well, helps you yeah, it's more like. Uh, you, you need to uh, execute sequence of steps mm -hmm. to prepare a solid state mm -hmm. of your uh, of your specific service. Uh, you you just need to copy some stuff sure. in yeah. order. So now, as already mentioned, it's possible to run Kubernetes on your laptop, yeah. and that's what Minikube project is all about. Uh, that's really awesome that it's possible to use Minikube right now on Mac uh, using um, Docker for Mac, and there's no need for VirtualBox anymore. That is uh, kind of cool. And as soon as you have your Kubernetes cluster running, um, how you can easily um, consume uh, some favorite apps uh, that you like. I don't know, you want to have MySQL running, you want Jenkins or whatever. Should you start from scratch? Or there's a way to uh, use some best practices that already uh, have been previously done by someone. There is a project called Helm. Uh, that's a package manager for Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use Helm right now to deploy Jenkins to my Minikube uh, Kubernetes cluster on my laptop. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, going to be fun. Yeah, so what we'll be doing, like you initializing your Helm, you'll see a list of applications. They call them charts. So you'll see a list of charts. You can find some chart you like, like Jenkins. You can install it. And that's actually what we are going to do now. So um, does this replace? I mean, most people when they deploy on Kubernetes, they'll use something like the registry, right? The Docker registry. Oh, that's that's a different level of abstraction. Right, right. Yeah, because when you're using your Docker, you of course will be still using your Docker registry, mm -hmm. either a private one or a public one. Right. Uh, what Helm is doing, uh, it providing you uh, like a mini orchestration framework where you are specifying 
I need to deploy that pods and these replica sets in that order. And there's a templating language that allow you to replace, uh, you know, uh, specific. Yeah, it's one level okay. above. It's like your YAM package uh, mm. uh, manager, for example, yes. but for Kubernetes. Cool. All right, so uh, where are we are now? So um, I'm in, in my laptop, uh, kubectl uh, get pods. Uh, there's nothing right now. Um, what I will do, I will in, uh, enable kube proxy. CPL proxy. Why I'm actually doing that? Because uh, there's a very nice UI currently available in, in Kubernetes. And when you do a kubectl proxy, you can access this UI using the local host. That's basically what I'm doing. Uh, as usual, there's a default namespace and there's a cube system namespace uh, where uh, system components are running, um, except uh, everything, uh, I mean, everything except this tiller is standard thing and tiller is the server side component that is needed for Helm. So uh, what we are going to do here, um, let me open another one tab. So um, Helm, list uh, there's a you see that there's nothing deployed right now in helm let me search for um, jenkins uh, predefined chart there's a uh, one called uh, jenkins in this table uh, let me quickly show where all these charts are located in the github there's a kubernetes charts um, repo and you see incubators table and test um, branches and in stable, uh, there's a number of uh, applications available, and one of them is Jenkins. So that's that's what I'm going to uh, to use now. So I need to make sure that the settings that we're going to uh, to send to Helm are the ones that I need. So I will do Helm inspect. Uh, I want to extract all the values from this uh, stable uh, Jenkins. Helm package, and let me put it to some uh, file, Jenkins, uh, Jenkins, uh, chart, for example, values, um, YAML. Why I'm doing that? Because I really want to know what are the customizable values that this chart has. So let's quickly have a look what's here. Uh, what is the image that we're going to use for Jenkins master um, image pool policy components amount of CPU and RAM used and what is interesting to me because I'm going to deploy to Minikube I am, cannot use a service type of load balancer Minikube is not supporting load balancer because well there's no uh, load balancer on my Mac right so that's why I have to expose that via node port so I will change that to node port and all the other changes, uh, all the other settings should be okay. I'm not going to change them. Uh, we'll deploy first, and then we will have a look at the uh, chart itself uh, to figure out what actually has been deployed. So now I'm doing Helm install. Uh, let me name that as a CI continuous integration minus F, the name of my file Jenkins chart values YAML, and uh, what actually I'm deploying. Um, I'm deploying. Uh, stable Jenkins chart. Uh, release named CI already exists, so maybe I already created the one. Um, so let me call it CI2, no matter how it's called. So look, um, Helm is really user friendly. It's showing you what is going to be created. Uh, there will be a secret, there will be a config map service, deployment, persistent volume claim, a lot of different things. So, and uh, by the way, uh, we can go right now to our UI and uh, for example, click on secrets and uh, refresh as well. I see nothing here. Uh, why is that? Uh, let me quickly Okay, because I'm in cube system, of course. What should I see in cube system? Cube system is a system namespace, and I'm deploying to the standard uh, default namespace. So here's my secret CI to Jenkins. Um, 
I mean, that's a service section. You know. So here's my secret CI to Jenkins. And you see that user, I mean, user and passwords are sitting in secret. Uh, the question is, uh, how can I now access uh, that Jenkins? So um, you see here some helper uh, commands from the chart itself saying that, hey, you can find the node port and node IP uh, by executing these kubectl commands. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I will figure out what is the node IP and uh, what is the node port. So now I will figure out the URL. You see my URL here. So if I'll copy that and I will go here, make sure that my proxy is disabled because that will not work on proxy. Um, yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing my uh, Jenkins UI and uh, most probably admin is my username. Let's check in the secret, yes. What is my password? Here's the randomly generated password for me. And uh, um, I can log in and here's my Jenkins running. Um, what is also interesting is that if I will go to manage Jenkins and check what are the plugins installed here, uh, there will be some um, non-default plugins installed, like Kubernetes plugin. Where this plugin is coming from? We are pretty sure that uh, the default um, uh, default Jenkins master Kubernetes um, image didn't have that plugin. Mm. So there was a way to install that plugin somewhere. Mm. So to figure out what actually has happened, let's go to um, configuration and uh, figure out what was actually done when we executed that Helm command. So in the templates folder, there are several YAML files, and that's exactly uh, the YAML files defining uh, Kubernetes objects that has been created as a result of my commands. Let's go to Jenkins master deployment YAML. So um, please don't spend too much time uh, trying to figure out what this double curly braces means. That's exactly the templating logic of uh, Helm. Mm -hmm. So uh, by using this template logic, uh, uh, that curly braces will be replaced with the actual values. What is really interesting for us here is that we're going to create a deployment here. So this deployment uh, is uh, actually uh, going to be based on the uh, specific pod. And this pod is uh, having specification. And uh, uh, look here, uh, we also have a init container here. Uh, what's actually happening is before the pod is scheduled, we actually um, mounting a Jenkins configuration files Jenkins home and Jenkins config, if we'll go down, we'll see that uh, this Jenkins config and Jenkins home are coming to us from the config map um, that is um, actually containing something. So what's in this config map? Uh, in this config map, uh, we do have a bunch of XML. And this bunch of XML is actually the uh, Jenkins uh, configuration that we are going to somehow inject into our container. So that's why this uh, Jenkins config map is mapped uh, as a volume. And uh, after that, we are actually using that volume uh, in the init container to copy this configuration from the config XML to the var Jenkins home. As a result of that action, uh, when we really spin up our container, it will be using uh, that, you know, that modified uh, state uh, with the, uh, with the uh, correct, uh, with the correct uh, XML data that we need. And everything else is um, pretty, um, pretty uh, common. We are using um, reference to secret here to make sure that we can uh, spin up uh, Jenkins with the right admin user and the uh, right password. Uh, using the Java options of Jenkins itself. We are exposing ports uh, that uh, Jenkins uh, should uh, really listen. Uh, we also have here some CPU and memory constraints that are coming from the values uh, that we specified in the, uh, in the Helm chart itself. So that's exactly, I really don't want you like to spend too much time trying to understand what's going on in this specific scenario. What I'm going to say is that 
The predefined uh, packages and charts that Helm provides is a great learning point. So you can always say, OK, I really want to deploy Drupal, but I don't know how. Right. Should I just have a look at what uh, the other guys have done? Mm -hmm. And you can, actually. Yeah. Just leveraging the ecosystem. Yeah, itself. just leverage the ecosystem. There is a lot of stable charts, and uh, there are the other incubator and test charts. Yeah. And you are super welcome to be added uh, to the community and just start cont contributing. Right. Because that's what everyone wants. Yeah. So um, are, are there any questions on that part uh, that popped up recently? Yeah, I don't see any questions, but I know you went through a lot of material there. Maybe you can just quickly summarize in a couple sentences what you just did. I mean, it looks like yeah. you had a mini cube, you spun up a cluster. It, it, absolutely. So uh, in, in my case, uh, mini cube uh, allows me to run Kubernetes uh, on, on my machine, right? right. Uh, if let's, let's make sure that it's running on my machine, right? So if, for example, um, I will do kubectl get nodes. I have a single node called Minikube. Mm -hmm. And uh, kubectl uh, uh, describe node Minikube. What you see here is that um, I have a single node that is uh, consuming six CPUs and six gigs of RAM memory running my machine. Mm -hmm. There's all the namespaces and pods, and uh, that all is running on my uh, single machine. So Minikube is the way for me to run my cluster. Mm -hmm. Now what I really wanted is to deploy some predefined uh, logic with containers, right? And that's uh, what I've used Helm for. Mm -hmm. And before I can uh, deploy Helm um, chart, I need the, to modify settings. That's why I said that I want node port, not mm -hmm. the cluster IP. I could also modify, let's say, the amount of RAM and um, you know um, CPU required for that. Mm -hmm. And after that, I just deployed uh, Helm. Helm uh, local uh, client has interacted uh, with the Helm server side component that was sitting on my Kubernetes cluster as well. Right. And uh, using the API server, all these different components like um, like secrets, like mm -hmm. config maps, has been created there. Yep. So those have to be done prior. I mean, to you even using Helm, you've had to set up the config maps. Um, yeah, that that was done the cr by creator of that specific um, Helm uh, uh, chart for Jenkins. Okay. So the chart will create all those for you. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then so you use Helm to. Uh, yeah, yeah. So in my in my file. case, I've copied <clears throat> locally uh, all that artifacts to the template folder. Okay. But it's not you who has created that. That's yeah, yeah, some yeah. Uh, some guy who That's really perfect. understands uh, how Jenkins is working. You just modify that, and that's the beauty of uh, of that from learning perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, cool. If you don't mind, I wanted to spend some time on Stateful. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe without a demo. Just a couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. Let's do a couple minutes. Yeah, of, yeah. You know, in the spirit of what's the latest. Like yeah, so that there. is an interesting point. Because previously, Kubernetes was a great way to run stateless workloads. Mm -hmm, right. But there was a lot of folks saying, OK, what about stateful? Mm -hmm. Stateful think, meaning like databases. Yeah, exactly. So Kubernetes is great if you have like a replica set and uh, you want to schedule three containers. One of them is down. Not a big deal. Uh, let me uh, just quickly schedule the other one. Right. That's what replica set um, controller uh, is all about. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of stateful applications like Cassandra, Mongo, MySQL, Zookeeper, and the others. Mm -hmm. They have this concept of the um, stable network identity, stable network IPs. Uh, there's a masters and slaves. They should be really a well-defined environment, and they cannot live in the world where containers are just you know going up yeah. and down, and uh, different uh, um, containers are having non-stable DNS names. And prior to this, people were probably just running them on VMs outside of the cluster, right? Yeah, and, and that is still um, possible. And we are not saying that stateful uh, sets that I will talk about in a minute is the only way to go. Right. Especially, there's no way right now to run stateful sets in this way that all your networking and uh, I/O throughput will be somehow isolated mm -hmm. for that uh, stateful workloads. That is not possible right now. So there's always a trade-off. You can use, let's say, managed service like Cloud SQL, right? right? And uh, um, 
using your Kubernetes cluster, you will be connected to Cloud SQL, right? But there's a way to run that now in Kubernetes. If you want. Yeah, if you want. And to do that, actually, uh, this, this problem was solved using the new controller called stateful, stateful set. Now you have a stable identity uh, and uh, persistent value claims that are associated with each member of the cluster. Um, there's a lot of um, configuration on that slide. Uh, so to define the uh, stateful set, you need to create so-called a headless service that will be uh, not having any IP address allocated. And after that, uh, you will define the stateful set specification by uh, specifying the link to this headless service, uh, number of replicas, what kind of templates are used to, um, to base your pods on, and volume claim, because you, of course, need somehow to very um, tightly um, um, bind your, um, your, I, your containers with, with your volumes, right? Volume should be stable. So that's actually what's going on. So what are the main properties of stateful sets? There's a deterministic initialization order. They are not just you know, automatically deployed all in once. If you have a stateful set of uh, three MySQL nodes, they will be um, you know, initialized one by one. And maybe the first of them, you will make it a master. And maybe the second and third will be slaves. And you can uh, you know, manage that uh, by yourself using initialization containers that we mentioned before. And network identity is stable. What that really means, and that's, by the way, um, the, the example where we are watching how the um, stateful sets pods are going live. And we see that it's just web 0 that is going live, and then it's web 1, and then it's web 2, uh, not just all in once. So there's a stable DNS name uh, that each of the pods will have with the, with the uh, stateful sets. and um, Using these DNS names, it's um, way easier to uh, to containers to communicate with each other uh, in the in the sense that uh, you can now have the um, uh, network connectivity between them defined, right? So uh, with the storage, which is also stable, you can make sure that persistent volumes and persistent volume claims uh, they've been initialized, and uh, um, if pod is restarted the same persistent volume is remounted. Mm -hmm. So that is really crucial for database, right? Yeah. These are the uh, properties uh, of the, uh, of the uh, stateful sets. So that's why you can react to uh, things like network partition uh, problem when uh, one of the containers and is not available and now uh, network is partitioned. Um, so that's not a problem for stateful sets anymore. Uh, we don't have time for that demo, but what I really want uh, for everyone to spend some time on, there's a tutorial on how to uh, run a replicated MySQL with the stateful sets. And it's a great one. It's really easy to set it up. And that's why I appreciate if uh, all the guys that are watching will spend some time on Kubernetes documentation. Uh, there's a tutorial section. And uh, in stateful application uh, subsection, there's the uh, basic example. And there's a pretty sophisticated one, how to run stateful application. And uh, it's based on the MySQL example. Okay. It's, again, not production ready. Uh, we are not taking care of security in that demo. But that will give you an idea what stateful applications is about in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and there's a lot, a lot of other things that are happening in the ecosystem right now. Federation, for example, that's right. a thing by itself. Um, things like pod affinity and anti-affinity and different scheduling decisions that can be done by Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. That is uh, also a very uh, important part. And uh, please make sure that you guys, first of all, understand uh, how community is working, because Kubernetes is a community-based project. Mm -hmm. Everyone can contribute. Everyone can uh, be a part of so-called SIGs, special interest groups. Mm -hmm. There are one for networking, for, uh, for storage, and so on and so on. Um, and yeah, just you know, have fun. Create your Helm charts. Uh, make sure that your, um, your Kubernetes uh, configurations are shared with the others. Ask questions and uh, just you know, uh, help all of us to make this product better. Yeah, no, that was great. So I had one question. I know, so with stateful sets, you 
probably don't use replica sets. Is that is that true? Absolutely, because these are like or orthogonal things. So right. it's either or. Right. Uh, that's a different logic. Would it make sense to use? No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we'll just sit on the chat for a couple more minutes. I don't see any questions. Maybe just because you explained everything really well, or or or, <laughs> or people or, are or, lost. Or not, or not really well. Yeah. <laughs> or, or not well at all. I know. I know I saw some people start dropping once they started seeing the, you know, once you start going into the config file, which is natural because people are like, oh my gosh, what is this? But uh, no, it, it was good. I, I definitely learned something. I, I know Rhea's sitting in the same room as me. Rhea, I mean, did you learn something? Yeah. 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 It, it went, it went, she said <laughs> it went over her head because she missed the beginner Kubernetes. So she kind of <laughs> skipped the uh, beginner one. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is that. It's, it's all about um, your practice and exploration, right? Uh, you can always quickly figure out what concepts are all about, mm -hmm. but the real uh, life examples that can come from Helm charts or from the your coworker mm -hmm. uh, example that she has shared with you, yeah. that's something that will help you. That's uh, cool, yeah, Helm yeah. is new to me. Oh, there is a question mm -hmm. from Gunjan. What does Minikube use to network the pods by default? What like Minikube used to network the pods by default? So um, that is a good question. I'm not really super deep in Minikube, but look, uh, when I've um, deployed Minikube um, node port, here's the IP address uh, that was uh, given to me. So uh, my assumption is that the, uh, the network interface uh, has been created uh, so let's check if config so there's the and uh, grab one yeah so there is the interface uh, that I have here. So maybe I need to do less. Yeah, there's a VBOX net interface <laughs> that is created. So mm -hmm. you see that it's a VBOX net interface, but actually, uh, VirtualBox is not running. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no uh, virtual. <gasps> Come on, I was cheating. Uh, look, I forgot one thing. When I was starting Minikube, mm -hmm. uh, there's a way to, uh, to run Minikube in a virtual box. Mm -hmm. That is by default. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's what actually happened. Mm. Uh, but uh, there's a way to uh, run Minikube right now using the Docker for Mac. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I think I forgot is um, if we'll go to the uh, documentation on the stateless application. There's a hello Minikube tutorial, mm -hmm. and one of the steps is here is start Minikube with the VM driver uh, X Hive. Mm. That's what I forgot. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, I was uh, using the uh, virtual box uh, network instead. It. It's okay. This was not a uh, Kubernetes with with a Minikube uh, right. demo. Right. It's it's, it's, it's just to, to show that uh, there's different uh, VM driver uh, that can be plugged into the Minikube. Mm -hmm. And depending on the driver that you use, your networking uh, right. on your laptop will be different. Right, right. So depending on, yeah. So you basically can choose. And I guess since yeah. today we didn't use many yeah. with the virtual box, we didn't choose. But I mean, the, the cluster itself, they're all on the same subnet. And then within the nodes where the pods run, you can define which network driver to use between well, I mean, th there's a network interface that is created for mm -hmm. you, right? And the the, the pods are interacting uh, using this network interface. Right. So that's that's exactly the L3 uh, networking that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Yes. Okay. Cool. Hope cool. that answered your question. I guess yeah. We'll, we'll we'll sit on the line for another couple more minutes and just banter back and forth. Ah, it's shame on me that I've started uh, virtual modes. Really, I was, you know, spending a lot of time trying to. I know you, know, you were bragging so. about how great the Mac was, and behind the scenes, you're using virtual bots. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so okay. you know what? What I can do? Uh, I can just do mini cube stop. Uh, not Moonicube. Moonicube. Moonicube stop. We'll stop the local cluster. Mm 
it will take some time. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, it stopped. So uh, VirtualBox is powered off. Okay, fine. So I think I need to kill that now. Um, it's not kill. Or is, it, is it delete? Yeah, I think it's delete. So machine is deleted. So there's no machine in VirtualBox anymore. So now what I can do, I can do minikube start and VM driver will be the one that is um, provided uh, on Mac OS and the one that is used by Docker for Mac. And you see that the local Kubernetes cluster is starting again. And there's no virtual box um, machine created. And uh, that means that uh, we are going to use the native Docker for Mac capabilities here. That sounds good. Yeah, so let's just you know use that three minutes to yeah. <laughs> to make sure Go that <laughs> that that scenario is also working. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. Um, it was such a challenging task to run Kubernetes on the laptop previously. Well, now. especially the cloud. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely. Yeah, and by the way, one more thing that I don't know that everyone is aware. In the if you use a kubectl, oh, we table client is really. Kubectl uh, config uh, get context. You'll see that in my case, me kube context is a primary one, mm -hmm. and I also have a GKE cluster. So what is actually possible? I can do kubectl use context uh, and the context name um, use. No, not use context. Kubectl config uh, use context. Uh, okay, kubectl config. Kubectl config use context, and I will switch context of uh, my kubectl. And uh, now, for example, if I will do kubectl uh, get nodes. What we'll get here, I have 10 nodes, not the one that is coming mm -hmm. from Minikube. Why is that? Because that's the 10 nodes of my GKE cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, cool. so you now, can basically switch between your yeah, local yeah. and and, so and now if you do, let's say, kubectl proxy, I will start proxying. Uh, I think I already have proxy running here. Uh, uh, yeah, on, on the other tab. I will start proxying. And uh, if I'll get back to my dashboard UI, and uh, we'll check that once again, and go to the nodes, here are my 10 nodes. Now I'm interacting with a different cluster. Yeah, that's cool. So you might have like one on AWS, the other one on GKE, and the local one, and just switch between them yeah. if needed, and uh, you know do different fun stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, that's how Thanks it is. Thanks a lot, Jim. That was great. I Appreciate you putting the demos together. I'm sorry we couldn't get to your other demo. Maybe we'll save that. Well, I feel like there's just so much content. That will here. be actually yeah. a homework for all the folks because uh, <laughs> it's like state. Typical team of giving homework out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really fun uh, running replicated MySQL yeah. tutorial that yeah. you guys just need to do and make sure that it's working. OK. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it. Uh, you can email us at GCP online or GCP meetup at google.com if you have any questions. Um, and, and you had Dima's Twitter handle was up there too. So Yeah, let me quickly get back here. To, yeah. Feel free to bug him. Absolutely. Thank you so much for everyone who has spent this hour with us. Yeah, and have you. a great day. Yeah, thank you.